Hi, I'm Mark Lawson, president of Morningstar Music Publishers, and we're so pleased that you've chosen to join us today for this webinar. Today's webinar guest is Michael Burkhart. Michael has many different areas of interest, and today we're concentrating on his work with children's choirs. Over the years, Michael has developed a wide array of resources that may be of help for those of you doing online uh, choir rehearsals at this time. All of those resources can be found on the Morningstar website, but there's also a special link in the description of this uh, YouTube, as well as on the chat page. So we hope that you'll take time to visit our website and to check out these resources. Michael is going to talk about the program that he, special program that he directs in Michigan and some of the things that have worked so well with him in conducting rehearsals. If you have questions as we go along, please, please feel free to put them into the chat function and we will be monitoring those and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end of this session. So Michael, please welcome. We're glad that you're here, glad that you could join us and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. It's a joy to be with you today and to get to talk to you about something that's very dear and special to my heart and that I'm very passionate about. Um, as we've embarked in a new way of doing things, I think we need to remember that in our work with children, they haven't changed, the message hasn't changed, our art hasn't changed, but the medium has changed. And maybe just putting that in perspective, it gives us permission to move ahead, to try things in a new way, and some of them may not work and others may work very well. What I'd like to do today is share some experiences that I've created for the Children of the Hearts, Hands, and Voices Worship and Fine Arts Program in Southeast Michigan. We are not associated with one particular church, um, but are really um, a community-based um, organization that works with children from a variety and diverse group of churches in our area. So I'm going to start a PowerPoint presentation and just share a bit about what we are about and how we've tried to stay together during this time of the pandemic. So our topic today is rehearsing virtually with children. I think one of the important things that we need to remember is that we've probably all established goals and philosophies for the programs that we lead and to keep those center and foremost even as we embark on this new medium of working with our children. So what I would like to do now is share several different online synchronous formats that we do with our children here in Southeast Michigan. The first is based on a five part structure. We begin with the gathering time and during that time, we try to give each child an opportunity to connect with everyone else. And I might provide a question to each of the children that they might talk to the rest of the group. We have found that this time is the most valuable time of our time together. We learned that um, when we started this program in last um, April, that the children did not have a lot of Zoom experience where they could actually communicate with other people. Their school experience was limited to online assignments and completing them without a lot of human interaction. And that was a great lesson for us because I think that is one of the most important things that we can do is keep our community ties and relationships growing. We often start with a question du jour or question of the day, which becomes the motivating um, force for the music activity or the focus that we engage upon during our time together. And often we return to that question after we've had a music or a worship experience related to the question so that the children can respond with their own answers and thoughts about the question. And we always end with some kind of a farewell. Um, one of the popular ones for us is one that um, is based on three H's and an FB. 
Um, we do it every time we meet in person, but we found that it's important to do it when we meet virtually as well. The three H's include a hug, a handshake, and a high five. And the FB is a fist bump with all of its varieties of style. Another structure that we use is we again begin with gathering time, but then we, we focus on worship and the PRs of worship, time of preparation both for ourself and perhaps the spaces in which we are meeting, the PR of praise, the PR of proclamation, and the PR of prayer. And again, closing with a farewell. Sometimes we engage upon storytelling as our centerpiece in the middle and how we can do that either with body sounds or instrumental sounds or environmental sounds to make the story come alive. So what I'd like to do is share some experiences with you. The first one is called an upside down season and it is to help us get ready for Advent. And sometimes we need to bring tons more energy and more creativity to our online presentations so that we can engage the children more fully. So for our upside down season experience, we begin with a number of pictures. By now, one of my children would have said, Dr. B, your pictures are all upside down. And I would have responded, you have a good eye. I wanted them to be that way. Because I was thinking that um, when we are getting ready for Christmas, lots of people's worlds were turned upside down over 2000 years ago, especially some of these people a young mother-to-be and her not-yet-husband and an innkeeper and a shepherd and sheep in the fields. During the season of Advent, we think about the world that was turned upside down over 2,000 years ago, as well as our own world turned upside down, either very personally, personally or worldly, as the pandemic has done during this time. But it's also during this season that we light candles placed on a wreath to help us remember and prepare for an upside down season, which turns our world right side up. When we did this particular theme one advent in a parish I served in Southeast Michigan, Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Livonia, we actually placed an upside down Christmas tree in the narthex to remind us about the upside downness of the season. And on Christmas Eve, that tree suddenly was placed right side up. We know that as educators that what we sing we will put in our hearts and minds more fully than words that we just speak. So a little carol um, describing this upside down season with a stanza of text for each Sunday of Advent is shown on the screen and now. And it's a simple little dance. If I were teaching it to my children right now, without even singing a note, I might just say, let's take a look at those notes and each of the four lines of the staves that are there. And could you tell me which um, numbered sentences or musical sentences that we see there are exactly the same? And they might say that one and three have exactly the same notes. And that might be a good place for us to depart simply by doing a rote um, experience where I might sing a phrase and then have them sing it back to me. This all involves lots of imagination on the part of the instructor as we asked, have to ask all of our participants to have their mute buttons on so that they don't disturb <laughs> what's going on in each other and cancel each other out. So the best way I know how to do a road experience back and forth is actually to sing a phrase and then to sing it again, perhaps in a different voice 
or a little bit lighter so that your children know and have someone to sing and guide them in their response. So this, this particular carol might happen in the following way. I might say, here's that first sentence that you said was the same as sentence number three. Carol this Advent and upside down season. Your turn. Carol this Advent and upside down season. You know, we're going to skip to phrase number three. It has new words, but it has that same melody. Carol this Advent for hope beyond reason. And perhaps when you think and they look like they know that well enough, we might say, let's put the whole carol together. You sing the first and third lines and I'll sing the second and fourth lines. Of course, I'm going to sing the first and third with them to give them confidence to do their part. If we put it all together, it might sound like this. Carol is Advent and upside down season. Sing of God's mercy each day and night. Carol this Advent for hope beyond reason comes in the Christ child, the world's true light. And that would be our offering for Advent 1. We could lend the rest of the stanzas for the remaining Sundays in Advent. Going on to another type of experience, one week we entitled our time together, Music and the Imagination. As mentioned earlier, we often begin our sessions with a question of the day. And our question that day dealt with the word imagination. And it often begins with the question, what if? And as we were thinking about that, about two, excuse me, about 300 years ago, tower or bell ringers ask a what if question. What if we could practice ringing bells in our hands before we ring them in the tower, thereby not disturbing the neighborhood with our bell ringing? Well, there some, was some exciting news. There were two brothers who got together and they responded to that what if question by creating bells that were to be rung in hand so they could rehearse their bell parts indoors without disturbing the town and the countryside. We know those bells today as hand bells. Eventually, people began to form groups to play these hand bells and composers began to write music for these hand bells. And we're going to visit a piece of music today. And I'm wondering if the composer of the handbell arrangement all night, all day, had any what if questions in his head that inspired his composition. Since I know this particular composer quite, quite intimately, I could ask these questions of the person. What if... Our screen sharing has momentarily paused. We're going to continue and see if it will continue now. What if some of the bells were rung and some were played with mallets? What if some of the bells were struck on the table? What if the melody was sometimes played by the high-pitched bells and sometimes by the low-pitched bells? What if the music was centered around pitch G? What if the music had four beats and two pulses per measure? What if the music was energetic and cheerful? Well, let's listen to the result of this composer's imagination.
And you get the idea. We would have listened to the entire piece and then stopped the presentation so that we could talk about what the children heard. And then we might start learning the piece in our own homes by first of all taking a look at the rhythm patterns that were used for the melody. And we might use a rhythm talk that we learn um, in our own individual settings. Some people might use Kadai, some people might use Edwin Gordon's syllables, some might use syllables that they've created on their own. Most of the children in our area are using Kodai in their school systems, so that's what we use for our program. So we might have practiced reading together after a steady beat was set, the following patterns that are on the screen. And so the first one is made up of, and they would answer half notes, and we probably would read ta, 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 ta easy. And they would discover that there's a third line that is exactly the same as one. And the fourth line is probably our simplest line. And it would be a great opportunity to introduce the whole note. Ta, 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 ta. And then we have that really energetic second line. Ta, ta, ti, 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 ta, ta, ti, ti, ya and that little syncopated figure at the end. After we had worked with all of those patterns, we could clap them, we could pat them, and we do them all in succession for the melody. Of course, the piece is more than just a melody, so we might do the same procedure for the bass rhythm patterns, and we might discover that patterns one, two, and three are exactly the same, and pattern four has those rests on the first beat of each measure, which we might use an open-handed gesture to keep track of as we are reading. Perhaps then you might try having one group of children do the bass rhythm patterns while the other group of children does the melodic patterns, all in preparation for a subsequent rehearsal in which the children would receive a piece of music emailed to them so that they could actually ring their part. And when we do that, we ask them to choose some objects to put in their hands that feel comfortable. Sometimes they will put silverware, but we often ask them to put a blue or red string on each of them to remind them of the left hand and of the right hand. So following along with all of that, we also sometimes take a look at going back in time and finding out that back in time is not so different than present in time. And so we would like to take a look right now at visiting Now Thank We All Our God. We did this experience early on in our time together virtually. And we began with this question. How can we be thankful when the world is hurting so much and filled with so many problems? But then we were reminded that over 400 years ago, there was a man who lived in Germany during a health crisis, similar to ours perhaps, and a war that lasted for 30 years. That man's name was Martin Rinkart. He was the son of a coppersmith and he was born in Eilenburg, a country village not far from the city of Leipzig in Germany. As he grew up, he realized he wanted to serve the people in his village, so he decided to become a pastor. During his time as a pastor, the Thirty Years' War struck Germany, causing unimaginable destruction, death, and famine across Europe. Many people fled to his village for protection. Eventually, there were so many people crowded in the town's halls that a deadly disease called a plague spread quickly, killing over 8,000 people. Among them was Martin's wife. And he, in the midst of all of these troubles and in the midst of losing his wife, was able to write incredible words of thanksgiving. And these are the words he wrote then. 
Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. I wonder if we could do the same today, writing such words of thanksgiving when so much is not going right. These words weren't left alone. Soon a melody for these words was written by one of Germany's most famous and finest musicians of the day. His name was Johann Krieger, and we would translate his first name as our simple John. And this is the melody that he created for those words. And of course, we'd listen to the whole melody, but in the interest of time, we're gonna move ahead right now because another John or Johann decided to use that melody and add another melody to it in one of his famous cantatas. And that person's name was Johann Sebastian Bach. Here's his dance-like melody that he added to the original melody. And of course, this dance-like melody, it needed a bass part to go with it. And so he created this sound. If we put all of those parts together with the original melody, we come up with this. And our children had learned this cantata movement prior to the pandemic, so they were invited to sing along as the instruments played their, the, the arrangement by Bach. <laughs> we would have listened to the whole thing and sung it all together. And then we ended that session with using the first line of that hymn, Now Thank Well Our God with Hearts, Hands, and Voices, as our prayer response to create a litany. And the children were asked to provide things um, that they were thankful for on that particular day. And every time they did, we responded by singing, now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices. And then they would continue on with other things they were thankful for and we would all respond together. And that ended up being our closing for the day. I know I'm going kind of as a whirlwind, but I wanted to share different ideas. Some of them you'll say, oh, we couldn't do these with our kids, but others you might say, oh, this would be perfect for us. So I hope there's something that you might find. But sometimes we want to tell stories, and I think it's fun to tell stories when we can tell them in creative ways that help us remember the feelings as well as the details of the story. 
So we're going to take a look, a brief look today of Parable of the Lost Son. Some people say this might have been called Parable of the Lost Sons, plural. Whatever, we know that it begins with a father and two sons. And so as we embark upon telling the story, we might decide as Wagner did in one of his major pieces that each character in the story should get a theme. And so the older son gets a theme that could be played on the soprano recorder. And it basically has three notes, our three starting notes for recorder. P, G, P, G, P, A, G, A, A, A. And that's our older son's theme. And then there was a family theme, which I won't sing for you now with that nice octave displacement that could be played by the alto and soprano glockenspiels. A clothing theme that might be fun to do, just even just speaking the words washed and pressed for this great day. And then there's that father theme, which some of us might recognize primarily as a broken bordoon for ORF instruments. And we have the other themes for the rest of our characters, a neighbor's theme. Neighbors, we, yes siree, ready to party. And then we have a xylophone part for the younger son, a friend's theme. We are ready, we are ready, we are ready for the party. And of course, then getting ready for the parties is the food theme. Chop, 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 slice, slice, slice. Oh, there's a misprint there. Slice, 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 mix all together. Excuse me, I will get that right this time. Chop, 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 slice, slice, dice, mix all together, whatever rhythm you want for that. And then as you're telling the story, every time your assigned group of people um, hear their part, they are either asked to sing it, to speak it, or to clap it along the way. So for example, the storyteller, me for right now, might say, once there was a father. And then we might hear, perhaps if they're doing this in their homes, the father theme tapped on somebody's lap who was given that assignment. And we might hear this. There once was a father, we hear the theme, who had two sons. He was very proud of them, both the older son. Oh, it's time for the older son to pretend to play their part on the recorder and the younger son. And then we get to hear that younger son's theme along the way. And then we get to hear the themes all together when all of those people come and are part of the story interacting with one another. So that you might hear what those themes sound like when you put them all together as they happen at the end of our story, when the family comes together, all the people are there to party, all of their themes work like this. <laughs> Maybe give it a try. If you don't have the instrument, substitute different sounds on your people's persons or sounds that they find in their households. This can work for a variety of different stories, a fun story to do. Um, hopefully we will we'll be doing it in person would be the story of Pentecost and creating all of the sound effects that go along with the events of that great day. And we'd like to take the opportunity to share one more piece with you. And it's called, um, really a, based on a question, how shall we live? Um, as the pandemic wears on and as it was wearing on for us in the spring, we notice people getting kind of cranky. We notice people, some losing hope, others becoming angry others becoming quite sad. And so we needed to ask ourselves the question, how shall we live during this time? 
Well, we get an answer both in the book of Deuteronomy and also in the book of Matthew. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. With that in mind, I asked the children to think about what words stood out. And we saw that these were three that stood out for us, heart, soul, and mind, really our whole person. And for those of you who know Helen Kemp's great work, she often began rehearsals, which we do every rehearsal in Hearts, Hands, and Voices with her chant, body, mind, spirit, voice. It takes the whole person to sing and rejoice. So in living today, we need to engage our whole person. To help us remember those words, we took a look at a Hebrew canon, which has fun nonsense words, but also can sing the English words we just heard from the book of Matthew. That Hebrew canon, the first part sounds like this. Hida, hida, hi, diddy, da, hida, 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 hida. And I would have the children echo me. We could be pat clapping or anything to add special rhythm to it. Then we sang the English words that go along with that melody. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And of course, if one part is good, there was another part. Hida, hi diddy tida, hida. Hida, hida, love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind. Well, that took care of the first verses of our Bible passage and how to live, but there's one more. Hida, 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 hi, love your neighbor as yourself. And as we learned all of the parts, then we put them all together, one after the other. But then we decided what would happen if we heard them all at the same time. That initial question that we started with, how will we live, turned into how will I love? And then each of the children were asked to share what came to their minds as how they would love in the world. These are some of the answers we received. I need to pray for the people right now so they can have patience during this pandemic. I can show my love for others by wearing my mask. I think we need laughters. I can make laughter. I can make people laugh. People can't see my face or my mouth anymore. So I think I can smile with my eyes to encourage them. A little while later in the conversation, the person who offered the suggestion of laughter also shared, you know what? And I could buy toilet paper for them to which most of the children um, chuckled and had a nice giggle about it, to which he responded, see, I made you laugh, we need to laugh. Just a little bit about what we're doing. It's not the end all, but we hope it's something that might be useful for you. Um, and it's a way of looking at things that you might already have in your repertoire 
but sharing them in a new way. But I think the most important thing we can do is to engage our children constantly throughout the process. Today was very quick to walk through different experiences and I would start and stop these presentations so that we could have interaction. The children need to see each other. They need to talk to each other. They need to sing, to you, sing with each other, make rhythm, make beautiful sounds together. And sometimes when their mute button's on, they can't really tell it. So we always end our session with, okay, you have permission, everybody to turn your mute button off right now. And we're going to get a 10 part canon of Haida, 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 because we could never do that if we were not Zooming. So I wanna say thank you for your time today. And maybe Mark, you have some questions that I do. I do. To... There, are, there are a few things. Uh, one was, can you repeat the chant that, that you, did right there at the end. Um, the chant from Helen? Yes. Body, mind, spirit, voice. It takes the whole person to sing and rejoice. Okay, and where could they find that? that that's. Um, you can find that in any number of Chorister's Guild publications. It's also in um, uh, a, uh, a collection of called Worship for the Young Child that I compiled of Morningstar resources and Choristers Guild resources that Choristers Guild publishes. Okay. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about making your visuals. Uh, what do you use and tell about uh, making the sound clips in them? How do you do it? Well, I, I knew a little bit about how to make a PowerPoint prior to March 13th, not what I know now. And I learned a lot by hit and miss. Um, but I primarily use PowerPoint presentation, which is often part of an office suite um, or, or a similar um, on, a, on, a, um, on an Apple or Mac. Um, and there are tons these days of downloadable non-copyrighted <laughs> pictures you can use. And so those are the, the, the illustrations I use. Um, part of it is my imagination. I try to also use certain symbols consistently throughout from one week to the next so that they have something to hang on to during the rehearsal. The scores that are put in there, um, for our particular circumstance, we work with second through seventh graders at the same time during the school year. And they're all of different abilities and some of them come with special unique challenges. So we purchase regular octavo scores for all of the pieces that we sing, but we also create a melody book of each of those pieces that the children use with those published scores. So the music that you see in the screens right now are actual pages from the books that they would use. The music um, that comes from it, um, when I first started this, I tried to play on my piano and I didn't have good microphone equipment. Most of the microphones that come with our computers are condenser type mics. And as soon as they, they sense too many frequencies, they just decide, oh, I'm gonna cut out right now. And so you might've heard just a few piano notes. So um, because I work with Finale and there are other music writing programs as well, but I work with Finale and they come with a set of instruments that you can assign to the notes that you put in. And so I experiment with that. Primarily there's a, there's a choir ah sound I use for the vocals. I often use the oboe because it's a pleasing sound to listen to, um, a cello, um, a flute, um, and then the piano. And um, you need to assign them to each line of music <laughs> that you are doing. But it's kind of fun for the children to hear, you know, the different colors. And it also gives you opportunity to talk about orchestrations then, which we didn't today, but even for the Haida Haida, you could say, okay, you know, we heard singers doing the first part, but the second part was played by what instrument? In this case, it was an oboe. The third part was played by a cello. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. One of the other questions was about your age groupings. And so you talked about second through seventh. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 when, when we are together, 
they are spaced to help each other, <laughs> you know? Um, and it doesn't mean that all the older kids are spaced in between, but given their special gifts and abilities, that's how they're spaced. And we have a number of special needs children in terms of autism or ADD. And so um, it requires trying to teach and provide experiences that will engage them kinesthetically, visually, and orally, and maybe teaching the same principle in three different ways to reach them all. We had another question about the light the candle. And I should say that the um, light the candle, which was used toward the beginning of the presentation, is out of a new collection that Michael did called Light the Candle. And uh, that's the upside down season uh, portion that he used. And we're actually going to have a whole webinar on using Advent songs. And we're going to do that on September the 23rd and we're gonna feature that collection. But if you want that collection, it's obviously on our website, it's product number 80-120. And talk just a second about what, what's in that collection, Michael. Um, the, the, it's a collection of resources that were used in a parish that I served um, for five or six consecutive Advents. Um, the first year we did um, the Upside Down Christmas, and we did it because I had come back from Singapore where um, I was there during the Advent season of, and the end of um, the fall season to work with my choir and do some concerts. And when I visited people's homes, many of their trees were upside down. And I said, oh, what's the Christian symbolism behind this? And they said, well, unfortunately there wasn't any. Um, it was just that it saved space on the floor. But it gave me the idea that you're thinking about how our world has been changed forever because of that first Christmas. So we embarked on it, it and it sparked, um, an attitude that nobody wanted to miss a Sunday in Advent. We've never had that before. <laughs> um, the other, there are other themes for each year. One of them is voice of the prophet. When we hear um, the voice of Isaiah throughout the readings for a particular season, each of them has an Advent candle lighting song. Each of them ha often has an offering song that goes with it. And sometimes a, a litany song in, that's responsive and they can be done with choir and congregation, or they can be done with a soloist and a choir, or they can be done by just a soloist and given our times, maybe the latter or a small group of people would be our choice for this kind okay. of event. Good, yeah, and we'll explore that collection in depth on the 23rd. Um, one last question, um, any comments about the length of rehearsals, what you would suggest? Um... We, we don't go longer than 40 minutes. And um, I shared this last night with a group of uh, directors. Um, our first 10 minutes are our gathering time and I'm committed to not starting our work together until we've all had a chance to talk to each other and share something. And by doing that, the children are ready then to be engaged to do something. And then when we start our activity, we often do something that we did when we met in person, kind of a signal, you know, to start the rehearsal. And ours is body, mind, spirit, voice, and, and we do it in all the different kinds of voices that we have. We have a copycat game that we play <laughs> with it. And then we sing, we sing it in canon. And the interesting thing, as soon as I start it, they all sit up on their sofa chairs or wherever they are sitting <laughs> in their house for the PowerPoint. Then we have our presentation, then we end. Um, so 40 minutes is a, is, a, is a good length. That gives us a half hour of good time working together. And you would think maybe 40 minutes is too long for the younger kids and too short for the older kids. But I find that the younger children do just fine during the 40 minutes. Sometimes it's the older children that get distracted more easily. I heard an interview with a child psychologist the other day about the importance of ritual and which is what exactly you're talking about, you know, and about the importance of when they center in on oh, this activity, that there's something that signals, oh yes, here I am. This is, this is what I do. This is my time to be in this place, you know? So I think your, your chant is, is your ritual. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. And our ritual at the end is the, 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 the three H's and the fist bump. And that's, it's, it's funny when we're in person, 
when they're get, they always have a choice. They don't have to take any of them, but they can choose. And they, they will choose one, maybe the first week, but by the end of the first month, they're choosing all four. And then they have a particular order they want them to happen in because they've created their own ritual of saying goodbye and yes. reaching out. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for sharing this today. It's just a wonderful, wonderful experience to get to see someone who's very active in this field to go through this and give us new ideas. And so I'm just wanting to remind you that all of these resources are listed in the on the web page in several different places, also on your description page uh, of the YouTube. And uh, we hope that if you have other questions that you'll feel free to write us. Um, Again, there are a few upcoming webinars. You can find all of those on our webpage in the, under the events tab. Our next one will be in a couple of weeks and we're going to talk with David and Susan Cherwin about planning Christmas programs, possibly without choirs and things to look at as based on their experience of planning the National Lutheran Choir uh, Christmas programs over the years. So we thank you very much for joining us. And Mac, Michael, thank you so much for all that you bring to us. And um, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. And